Expressionism was an artistic movement that originated in Germany at the start of the 20th century. The expressionistic style was originally used in the mediums of painting, poetry, and architecture, but soon spread to other artistic mediums such as film. The key tenets of expressionism lie in the abandonment of realism and the portrayal of the world as an expression of an emotional or psychological state, often portraying characters on the edge of society. Expressionist films were popular in Germany throughout the 1920s, but the style declined in the 30s as German moviegoers, thanks to more lax censorship policies, had growing access to foreign films. Although expressionist films fell out of fashion in Germany, their influence can be seen in many genres of film, particularly thanks to the immigration of several influential expressionist filmmakers to America under the threat of World War II. The influence of these German filmmakers can be seen in many Hollywood films of the time, particularly the film noir and horror genres. Expressionist films usually seek to portray the inner experiences and emotions of their characters in the atmosphere of the film. Expressionist films usually center around disturbed characters on the fringe of society, characters who are often in extreme emotional turmoil. It is the desire to portray the inner experiences of disturbed characters that often leads to the aesthetic for which Expressionism is most associated with. A dark and shadowy, disturbing atmosphere where things always seem slightly off. The key way in which expressionist films build up this atmosphere is through the use of mise-en-scene, or the visual theme of the film. A good example of the visual themes of expressionism is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, one of the most influential expressionist films, and still one of the best known, directed by Robert Wine and released in 1920. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari is about a mad doctor named Caligari who comes into town with the fair and a sleepwalker named Caesar locked in a cabinet. When Caligari lets Caesar out, it is either to tell fortunes or to commit a murder. The cabinet of Dr. Caligari makes extensive use of set design to convey the inner turmoil of its mad characters. The houses of the town are misshapen and decrepit, with windows and doors that are seemingly placed haphazardly and at weird angles. The set designers expound the effect with the use of furniture that is misshapen and painted backdrops that wind and curve into the distance, giving the town a claustrophobic, labyrinthine feel. Dietrich Schoenmann said in his essay, Once More on Wines, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, As we know from the narration of production details, expressionism entered the film through the design of the sets. It is through the curved walls, the oblique windows, slanting doors, and strange radial pattern patterns on the floors that the film establishes its nightmare atmosphere. Eisner adds the observation that a variation of shots i.e., the attempt of producing emotional responses through cinematic means, such as camera movement and unusual angles of shooting or editing, remains absolutely secondary. In expressionist film, the image is of paramount importance, and Wine wisely lets the images speak for themselves. In The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, 
the audience is presented with immaculately composed images, and their weight is only heightened by wine's choice to let the audience lose themselves in the image, rather than focus their attention with a more directed approach. Even the characters seem at the mercy of the sets in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, often almost becoming one with the background. There is a shot in the film where Caesar, as an extension of Dr. Caligari's madness, is on his way to murder the heroine, and he creeps out of the shadows along a wall, almost as if he were connected to it, towards the light of the heroine's house. This is the moment in the film where Caesar asserts his independence from Caligari, and he is only able to do so because he is so enthralled by the beauty of the heroine. Not only does the shot echo Caesar's transition from the shadows and domination of the madness of Caligari to the light and enthrallment by the beauty of our heroine, but he physically becomes part of the scene composition, which implies that because of his physical movement through the film, his mental state is at the mercy of the environment he inhabits. It is eventually revealed that the main protagonist and narrator is a patient at an insane asylum, and the murderer, Dr. Caligari, is in reality one of his doctors. Much analysis and thought has been put into this twist ending by scholars, and whether it makes the cabinet of Dr. Caligari a revolutionary or conformist film. Both the flashbacks and the framing device are done in a clear expressionistic style which may indicate the madness of the protagonists in both sections. So because all the characters are mad and the style unchanging, the focus of the analysis must be put on Caligari himself, who is the key character within both sections of the film. It is clear that in the main section of the film, Dr. Caligari is a madman and a murderer, not an authority figure, as some analysis would suggest, as the authority figures in the delusion are represented by the town clerks one of whom Dr. Caligari kills. When the twist occurs, it is revealed that the protagonists are insane, and it shows how quickly a character such as Dr. Caligari, that was once a madman on the fringe of society, can become an authority figure. Siegfried Crosser said in his book, from Caligari to Hitler, a psychological study of German film. By making the film an outward production of psychological events, expressionist staging symbolized, much more strikingly than did the device of a framing story, the general retreat into a shell which occurred in post-war Germany. While it is never made entirely clear if, so, if certain characters are mad, and others are not. It is clear from the unrelenting stylistic direction of the film that the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is meant to thrust the viewer into a world overcome by madness.
good complement to the mise-en-scene expressed in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari is the design of another 1920 expressionist film, The Gollum. Directed by Paul Weninger and Carl Bose, The Gollum is a retelling of the myth of a, a Jewish rabbi who calls upon dark spirits in the creation of a golem, an indestructible clay giant whom the rabbi intends to use for the protection of his community. While the Gollum shares much of its style with the can of Dr. Caligari, its main visual motif is the contrasting of the Jewish ghetto with the palace of the Holy Roman Emperor. The ghetto has much in common with the town in the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. It features leaning buildings with haphazardly curving and asymmetrical doors and windows. The ghetto of the Gollum is, however, far more constructed and physical than the ethereal town, as it consists of actual buildings rather than painted backdrops. This gives the film a more naturalistic tone. The Gollum, the ghetto does not signify the outright madness but rather the desperation of its Jewish inhabitants, and even more importantly, their precarious position within the society of the times. The inside of the homes, however, appear winding and cave-like, teasing of the ancient mysteries contained within. The palace, in contrast to the ghetto, is very pomp and ornate. The walls are covered in intricate flowing patterns, and the occupants wear elaborate costumes. The previous two films established expressionist worlds as a starting point for their stories. But The Hands of the Orlock, a 1924 effort that reunited the cabinet of Dr. Caligari director Robert Wine with star Conrad Voigt, takes a somewhat different approach.
Hands of Orlac centers around concert pianist Paul Orlac, whose hands, which are lost in an accident, are replaced by the hands of a recently executed murderer. Orlac's life is relatively normal to begin with, but the loss of his hands sets off a destructive chain of events in his life, which are realized through the use of expressionist imagery. The hands that Orlock receive act as a catalyst for all his troubles. He can no longer play the piano, and he is in financial trouble. His relationship with his father deteriorates, and he is plagued with murderous desires, which he thinks springs from his hands. The Hands of the Orlock is more realistic than The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but it is a dark and shadowy film, and as Orlock's troubles increase, the expressionist imagery becomes more pronounced. seem to take on a life of their own. As Orlok's despair grows, they continuously seem to pull him into the darkness of the shadowy sets on the film. There is one scene near the end of the film where Orlok discovers the body of his murdered father. As the police investigate, Orlok's hands touch his lips and stroke his face, almost as if in an effort to keep him quiet, before they almost literally drag him from the room into the darkness. As said, German Expressionist films often center around characters on the fringes of society, and often those who are going through extreme emotional turmoil. The 1922 film Nosferatu, directed by F.W. Murnau, centers around a twisted love triangle involving a young couple and a vampire. Atypically for an Expressionist film, Nosferatu is filmed on location, and unlike the visuals in The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and The Hands of the Orlac, which used character devices such as Dr. Caligari and Orlac's hands to draw the protagonist into a world of madness, the scenery is often more directly related to the plights of the individual characters.
The opening scenes show a young couple amongst flowers associating them with love and serenity, but their love is disrupted by the intrusion of Count Orlok, a vampire. Orlok is shown to represent disease and decay. He is associated with rats and brings the plague wherever he goes. Besides disease, Orlok represents the parallel idea in the world of the film, lust. He lusts after the blood of Thomas, but his attention soon diverts to Thomas's wife, Ellen. Orlok is often associated visually with arches and empty buildings reminiscent of his coffin. His intrusion into Thomas and Ellen's relationship is foreshadowed by a large, hollow, unnatural looking building across from their house. When Orlok moves into the building, he represents a malevolent force, especially to Ellen, who in some cases seems to long for his presence. Thomas Kobner says in his essay, Murnau, on films as intellectual history, in his ambivalent appearance, Nosferatu represents a fantastic undead from the realm of repressed obsessions who teaches fear and trembling to the sailors on the ship and Ellen. Ellen, however, despite her desires and longings, destroys the strange lover. When Alan destroys Orlok, who was in the end done in by his own lust for her, it is a victory of selflessness over desire, and the plague is physically destroyed by her purity.
Because of the expressive nature of the film, the acting is especially pronounced. In Nosferatu, Orlach, as played by Max Schreck, dominates and shuffles through his shots as a silent menace, unlike Conrad Vayet, who, in both The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and The Hands of Orlach, emotes his expressions, in some scenes appearing to almost dance through the sets. Because the unbalanced nature of the characters that are being portrayed are key, just as much as the set design in the realization of expressionist characters. Take another film by F.W. Murnau, 1924's The Last Laugh, which tracks the shaming and subsequent despair of an aging doorman. In The Last Laugh, Emil Jannings plays an aging yet proud doorman who is demoted to a bathroom attendant because of his age. In the beginning of the film, we see a shot of Jannings through the revolving door which he attends. It is described by Siegfried Crosser as something between a merry-go-round and a roulette wheel. Over the course of the film, there are several great expressionist images, such as the revolving door and a building seemingly falling on Jennings during his walk home, which, without his uniform, is a source of great shame. But as a whole, the film is more naturalistic than many of the films that fall into the Expressionist category. Jannings, who would later play the devil in Murnau's Faust, is the glue that ties the Expressionist imagery together. Jannings gives a sensitive yet emotive performance. He is all taut and outstretched hands and bulging eyes as he makes his way from scene to scene. In the scenes of Jennings walking home, his anxieties about his position become nearly overwhelming. You see his hair and beard blow in the wind as he looks forlornly at the hotel, which used to be a source of pride. It should be noted that in The Last Laugh, the camera is freer than in, the, uh, than in other expressionist films, often tracking the actors or going in for a close-up. This is the antithesis of such films as The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, where the camera simply holds its position and takes in the composition. It is this very move of freeing the camera that in many ways took the focus off the macabre scenery and put it on the characters, a trend that foreshadows the end of the expressionist movement and the absorption of its tenets into film as a whole. While it is moody, dark imagery, which is often associated with German Expressionism, several key films in the movement subvert this notion. Fritz Lang dubbed the master of darkness for, among others, his satirical crime thriller, Dr. Mabuse, The Gambler, directed several Expressionist epics in 1924's The Nibelungen and 1927's Metropolis. While the epic and the expressionist film may not seem like an appropriate mix, Lang masterfully weaves their tenets together, both in creating two distinct worlds and encapsulating his characters' emotions in the imagery and visual style of these works. While De Niblingen, the story of the ancient Germanic hero Siegfried, features many dark, unsettling images, its most accomplished shots make use of Lang's classical, monumental style that incorporates centered, balanced, often geometric compositions to portray the unyielding, stoic nature of its heroes.
One of the best examples is when Siegfried enters the court of Iceland. An overhead shot that heavily uses geometric patterns on the floor while incorporating a line of knights on either side of the frame into the composition. Siegfried's entrance into this image's composition shows his entrance into an unyielding society. Metropolis, a dystopian sci-fi thriller, takes this idea even further to more abstract and expressionist extremes. The film opens in a garden, symbolizing the serenity of the main character, but he soon enters a world of looming buildings and giant overbearing machinery. The machines, which often have no discernible purpose, incorporate the oppressed workers into their very structure, implying that their physical nature in the film is a means of oppression by the upper class residents of the buildings that tower above the machines. Siegfried Crosser discusses this ascension to detail in reference to the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in his book From Hitler to Caligari. The attempt made in Caligari to coordinate settings, players, lighting, and action is symptomatic of the sense of structural organization which from this film on manifests itself on the German screen. It is this attention to a holistic universe by Lang and other expressionist directors, the merging of character and setting, that defines the expressionist movement, rather than one aesthetic or another.
Although German Expressionism, in its strictest sense, fell out of favor in the 30s, the spirit of the movement lived on as several key German Expressionists integrated the style into sound and later Hollywood films. Fritz Lang directed M and The Testament of Dr. Mabuse, which were both extremely influential in the establishment of the film noir genre, which takes its dark, gloomy aesthetic and fringe characters from German Expressionism. M, in particular, was influenced by Alfred Hitchcock's silent film, The Lodger, in which Hitchcock played with expressionist tropes he learned in Germany. F.W. Murnau also went on to success in Hollywood, directing Sunrise, A Song of Two Humans, a film with clear expressionist sensibilities. The continued work of these directors and the film community's continuing fascination with the expressionistic abandonment of realism and the stylistic portrayal of characters keeps the movement relevant even in the language of today's films.